Uh, the fly I'm going to tie today is uh, my version of a skating crane fly pattern. I'm going to combine several different styles in it and uh, I think the best thing to do is just start and describe it as I go. So what I'm using here is a, uh, it's a Daiki size 8 1750 hook. The important thing for any skating fly is uh, you want to have a hook that is, has a straight eye. This, eye, this uh, hook has a straight eye and when I say a skating fly this will be an upside down pattern because I want it to skate over the top of the water without the point of the hook as a keel. So what I'm going to do is start the thread about uh, one third of the way back and just work my way toward the back. Since this is a woven pattern, what I'm going to do at the rear of the fly is something that, uh, that George Grant from Butte, Montana did on all of his woven flies was he put a knob at the back of thread and what it does is it keeps the horse mane, which I will be weaving this with, uh, it keeps it from slipping down over the back of the fly. And as you will see in a little bit, what I will do is I will take this knob and then I will finish it off just like you would with all of the care that you would take on the head of the fly. So what I did is I formed this small knob. I'm going to go to the back or the front and I'm going to just throw a half hitch here and I'm going to start tying in the materials. All right, the first thing that I'm going to tie in on this one is a, uh, the stripe. The stripe is going to be on the top and the stripe is made out of, this is just your standard embroidery thread. Uh, this is orange embroidery thread and it's, it's, you can buy this at any, uh, any craft shop, material store. Standard embroidery thread, it comes with uh, six strands and I'm going to use three of them. I pull them apart and use, use three strands. You need a piece about eight inches long so you'll have plenty. Don't short yourself on the embroidery thread. It's inexpensive and there's no reason to make it difficult weaving with a short amount of the material. So what I'm going to do, this stripe will be on the top of the fly. So whenever you are weaving this pot weave, which is what I will be using, you always want the orange on the far side. Since I will leave the hook, I will not invert it like I would on another pattern called the sandy mite, where the stripe would be on the belly. This will actually be on the top of the hook. Now that will actually be the bottom of the hook because it's an inverted fly. But for weaving purposes, I tie that orange, orange stripe material in first and I put it on the far side of the, of the fly. If I were going to be inverting the hook, I would put it on the near side and then turn it over and it would be on the far side. So since this one won't be inverted, it goes in on the far side. The material that you use for this fly is horse mane. A uh, horse tail is too coarse for weaving this, uh, this type of a weave. So what I do is I take horse mane, I trim it off, bunch it together and get most of the short fibers out of it and then I bundle it up and tie it off and then I just take off however many I'm going to need. I can't tell you you need a certain thickness. I, I'm not going to count the fibers there. I'm just going to say it takes a little while to get used to what you need. So as you can see, I'm sectioning off about that much material and that's all I'm going to need for this. So I'll trim it off. As you can see, it's, it's not overly thick because too much, you get way too much buildup on the fly and you're not looking for that. What I'm doing here is I'm just holding down farther. I want to have at least seven or eight inches of the material to weave with to make it easy. So what I did was put my fingers down about here and pulled out the shorter fibers. So got the horse mane here. What I do is I trim these off even. And one step that I take, because I'm always trying to minimize the amount of bulk at the head of a fly, so I take, these are, these are thinning shears that a barber uses. This is a very small pair of them, but as you can see, little teeth on them here, so when you, when you cut it, not all of the fibers are cut. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting them just right at the end there to thin out a few of the fibers so that it won't have the full size bunch right at the front of the hook. Then I'm wrapping that down and I want that to be on the near side here. 
So you have the orange on the far side of the hook, you have the horse mane on the near side of the hook. So I'm going right back to that knob that I put down there originally. I'm going to come to the front, half hitch it, and then I'm going to go ahead and just put a whip finish on it because I'm going to remove the thread because you don't want the bobbin hanging there when you're trying to weave. In fact, you really can't do it with the bobbin hanging there. So just, you know, put three or four wraps with a whip finish on there and trim it off. Now, the weave is called the pot weave. And it was, it was uh, originally done to tie a pattern, like I mentioned, called the sandy mite by a, uh, a barber in Missoula, Montana. His name was Franz Pott. And he was a German barber and a wig maker. And Pott came up with this weave for the body. And uh, supposedly it was originally done to support the horse hair so it didn't come unraveled. But uh, what they found is that having a stripe material that you use to keep the horse hair in actually made the fly more effective and you could change the colors of the stripe and come up with a much more effective pattern. So to start the weave, the first thing that I do is I, I take the, the stripe and I put a little bit of wax on it. And you just, just put that through it. What you want to do is you want to be able to get plenty of uh, grip on this. And wax is a wonderful thing. You can get, it helps you grip, but it also lubricates. And it makes things stick, but it also lubricates them. So it's very helpful in a lot of fly tying. I take what's left on my fingers here and put it on the horse mane just so that they both have a good grip. If, especially if it's a dry day and you're trying to hold on to this, you have to put a lot of tension on this when you're weaving it and you have to be able to get a good grip. You definitely have to have this very tightly in the vise as well because you're going to put a lot of tension on it when you do the weave. Okay, so the pot weave. This is how it's done. You come up and you bring the orange embroidery floss piece behind the horse mane. I hold the horse mane up straight. I come around the horse mane with the orange floss and then I come under and around the hook. And then I switch my fingers and notice how I catch that here between my, th I'm catching that between my thumb and my middle finger. You have to keep a lot of tension on this. So I'm holding that there, I've switched hands and I come around with the horse mane and I come underneath and I come back up with it and then I drop the, the orange floss around it again. I come around the hook. I come over with the horse mane. So when you're coming underneath with the horse mane, what you're really doing is you are covering up the orange floss on the bottom. So what you'll end up with is on one side you'll have the orange stripe, on the other side you will have the horse mane. So I just bring it up and you repeat this process until you get up to the front of the fly. Now, if you want to learn to do the pot weave and uh, you want to learn to do uh, woven hair hackles, which is another thing, the best way to do it is to get a book called uh, George Grant's book called The Art of Weaving Hair Hackles for Trout Flies. That book is available through the Big Hole River Foundation and their website is bhrf.org and I highly recommend that you get that book because number one you're supporting the Big Hole River Foundation and number two it's an excellent book and it has all of these weaves in it and uh, it's it's extremely well done with excellent drawings. So. I just keep coming around now I'm getting up closer to the eye here and how to finish this off is uh, that's something that you need to watch very closely because there's a way to do it that makes it very simple but if you don't know how to do it and it's explained in the book <laughs> Uh, it's very difficult to tie it off. Okay, so what I've done is I have come around the horse hair or the horse mane and I'm coming around the hook. I'm coming back up 
Now, instead of taking the horse mane back around at this point, I put the embroidery floss in the material clip of the vise. I hold that there, and what I'm going to do is bring this horse mane around, and then I'm going to tie it off. You need to keep tension on this in order to get a good stripe and make it look nice. So, what I do is I take my index finger, I push that down hard against what I just did there, and you bring it all the way around the hook and back down the far side. And as you can see now, I've got a nice, tight grouping of horse hair right there. Then, you take your bobbin, you restart the thread, you have to multitask here, do a couple of things, hold on to one and then use your other fingers to get the thread restarted. You come around behind the horse mane and you have to keep this very tight. You don't want to go loose on it right now because that horse mane is fairly stiff and it will unwind on you if you don't. So, And I'm binding this down very tightly because, like I said, this will spring out if you don't. So that should do it right there. And let the tension of the bobbin hold it. One thing I might say, this bobbin is, is great for these because it's heavier than most bobbins. It's also shorter because you, do, you don't want the bobbin hanging down here. So this is one of the S&M bobbins that is uh, that's been made for years. Uh, but now uh, the Wasatch Tool Company does them with a ceramic tube in them, which has been a major improvement on the, uh, on the bobbin. So they do it in conjunction with this company. But this is a, a really nice bobbin for doing these flies. So now that I have the wraps around that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim off. And notice when I do this, I'm going to cut the horse hair. Big problem with fly tying is always yeah, cutting your thread. What you want to do is just put your finger there so that you don't cut the thread. I mean, I'm cutting the piece of thread that I started with, but the thread that's on the bobbin, you definitely don't want to cut that. So what I'm doing is just trimming off the horse hair, and I'm going to throw a couple more wraps over that. Now, when I said that if you don't know how to finish off the fly, it's, it's difficult if you don't do it this way. Now you can see what I have here is I have an orange stripe, and then I have the horse mane on this side. So if these are a little bit off, it probably doesn't make a bit of difference on the fly, but what you can do is you can take a, an embroidery hook and you can just straighten them a little bit. Just do a couple wraps. Now what I'm doing is you can see I have this, this embroidery thread and what I'm going to do is just pull it the same angle as the other orange wraps. And then I just go over it with the thread. It's very simple, but if you don't do it that way, you know, when you get to the end, unless you know how to, how to wrap it off like this, it's very difficult to do. So just, that's the one technique that makes it very simple. And I just trim it off. So, that, now the next thing that I'm going to do, you remember this little knob that I did at the back. I'm going to put about three or four wraps on a whip finish here just to, because I'm going to cut the thread off again. What I want to do is go to the rear of the fly, and I want to finish off that little knob just like it's the head of the fly. George Grant always used to say that the same exact care that you use for doing the head of the fly you do with the rear of the fly. And uh, aside from holding all of these materials in and making it just a more durable pattern, you're also making it more attractive. It's just, it's a nicer looking fly with that end done like that. So I'm just going to take the, the large whip finisher and I'm going to finish that off just the same way. Now, when I'm doing this, you don't want to do too many wraps because I just wanted to leave enough so that I could do a nice taper and that I could see it. Uh, my friend Todd Collins from Butte, Montana has always said that a good, a good thing to know about fly tying is that one step beyond perfection is disaster. 
that's definitely the case on this because if you do too many wraps, all of those thread wraps will slide down the hook. Then you've got to undo them all again and start over. Not the whole fly, but I'm saying just that little knob. So it just, just do what you need to do. Don't do any more than that. As you can see, I have a nice taper on the back here now. So what I'm going to do is use, um, use super glue on the back, which I actually use as a head cement. This is, uh, this is a great product for fly tires. This is called Loctite uh, Super Glue. And the beauty of this is, is that it has a brush that comes in it. What you do is, you'll, you, when you get it, you take out the brush, you dip it in acetone, and then you, to get the glue out of it, and then you trim the fibers down. And as you can see, this one has about four or five fibers to make it small. The brush is considerably larger than that. You trim it down so that you can use it to get glue in, and you just finish off the back knob on the fly just as you would the head of the fly. This glue has a nice gloss to it, and it is bulletproof once it's on there. Once it dries, you're not going to get those threads undone. Some people like to untie flies to see how they're tied. You're not going to cut the heads off on one <laughs> that is where super glue has been used. Okay, now the next step is I'm going to tie in the thread on the front of the fly again. Now, since this is a skating pattern, I'm going to put basically what they are is outriggers or pontoons on it so that it skates. This is elk mane. This is what I use. And this is, a, this is a beautiful thing, as you can see. And what I've done is processed it from the hide. You take it off, you stack it, you get all of the short ones out, and then you, uh, you bundle it up. As you can see, I've, I've wrapped thread around the bottom and I've whip finished it. And so you have these nice bundles uh, to work with and all of the ends are already evened. So this is a, a it's off of, like I said, it's off of the mane of the elk, both the cow and the uh, bull elk have uh, mane hair that is, that is usable. And uh, it makes very nice pontoons for this fly. Again, how much to use? That's, that's how much I'm going to use on each side. Uh, I can't tell you how many fibers it is. It's something that when you tie it, you'll just know that it's, it's, it's enough. Now, I put them out to the side. As you can see, what I'm going to do is put this out to the side here. And I want it just a little bit past the back of the bend of the hook. So I'm just tying it in. So you can see there that it's on the stripe and on the back of the hook you can see how far it extends in the back there. So you make a few wraps there. and just trim them off. Then you're going to do the same thing on the other side. Now if you live in the mountain states and you're wondering about this elk, you're probably not going to find it in a fly shop. <laughs> you're going to, but most people who live in the western states know someone who hunts elk. Just have them save the mane for you. And uh, then to process it, just wash it up and then uh, put borax on it and just leave it out in the garage for a while. Just borax the back of the skin and it'll be just fine. Okay, I'm going to do the other one. If you want some really nice elk mane, you can get it from my good friend Todd Collins in Butte, Montana. He does sell, he does sell very highly selected ones. And you can see the ends on this are really pretty. You can see the variegated effect. This was from one of the hides that Todd gave me. So you can get that from, from Todd Collins in Butte, Montana. So I'm just going to trim off the other side. Now you hold them down, give them a good, good cinching down here. So as you can see now, what I have is two pontoons going out the back, and this fly is going to ride with this side down and the hook up. So those are the pontoons that will be used for skating. And then the final step on it is just to wrap a hackle on it. So uh, either a, a neck or a saddle hackle. This is a brown hackle, and it's a brown roughly a size 8. What I'm going to do is just uh, trim it out at the base here, wrap it on, 
And then I'll finish off the fly. Now this pattern, I borrowed a few things from it. As like I said, I borrowed the pot weave and this is very similar to the Gary LaFontaine Dancing Caddis, which had the pontoons out to the side and a hackle on the front. And uh, it's, in fact, it's exactly the same as the, the LaFontaine, except he used deer hair off to the sides as opposed to the elk mane. So you could always use that if you needed to. So, there you go with the hackle. I'm going to go ahead and use hackle pliers because I want to use all of this and I'm also going to use the rotary feature on the vise. So I'm going to throw a half hitch in here so I can, I can, so I can get it right up to the end. So I'm just going to put a nice stiff rooster cape hackle on there, pull these back, tie this off. Trim out the loose ends here. In Mike Lawson's book called Spring Creeks, he talks about being out with his brother. And they were uh, on a river in Montana, and these fish were rising and making huge rises. And they didn't know what it was, and they figured out that it was a crane fly. They had nothing to match it, and then his brother found these two big horsehair patterns in the bottom. I think he had three patterns, actually. And Mike broke the first one off on a fish, and his brother broke off the last two on fish, large fish. He says, you don't need them always, but you better have them when the situation is right, because the fish will hammer them. And you better be ready when they take a crane fly, because they do take them very aggressively. And I'm just going to go ahead and whip finish it to finish off the, the head. Okay, now, to ensure that it skates in, you know, upside down, you can see now that we have the pontoons, the stripe, and the hackle on, I'm going to go in and trim out the center of the hackle. Now, I have to admit, it goes against my grain to have to ever trim a hackle, but that's how this pattern is done, and that's what ensures that it floats in an inverted position with the hook point up. So there you have it, and as you can see, it's flat on the bottom. So that pattern will skate beautifully for crane flies, which do skate across the surface. And you'll come across a time when you're out fishing, and it'll be in the evening usually, and you'll wish you had a pattern like this, because they work extremely well in that situation. Finish off the head with the super glue. So there you have it, a woven skating crane fly using the pot weave.